Hello. Welcome to 1914. You wouldn't really expect that would be much going on in the dreadnoughts from around the world in 1914. You'd expect 1914, war starts. So what's going to be happening? Well, actually a lot. The Germans announced the Mackeson class battlecruiser. Which is not necessarily as disappointing as the Goinig spec. Uh, the... Um, Bayon class battleship was because yes they have eight 15 inch guns still uh, they have eight 13.8 inch guns so they're theoretically more far and more powerful than any of the British battle cruisers at the time which have 13 inch gun 13 and a half inch guns so the guns are a little bit bigger Theoretically, a little bit more. It's not much. It's not enough to really write home about, but it's a bit. They've got 28 knots of speed. Woohoo! They've got 8,000 nautical miles at 14 knots. That's good. These are far more to write home about, and they are shaped, and they look lovely. They have 32 boilers, which, with four geared steam turbines, develop... 88,769 shaft horsepower. It's all good. The problem is... The drawings... One of those hulls up there... Are the closest the Germans get to them. They eventually start... This is the other point you have to remember about the Germans. Half their... A large chunk of their best designs never make it off paper. So we are talking about vaporware. You can say it's because war happens. That's what I would argue, certainly, with some of the British designs. But the fact is, the British turn and continue building the R-Class battleships create the R-Class battlecruisers, largely by cutting some R-Class battleships. Queen Elizabeth's class, cut a couple of those, but I'm going to cut one of those, but build the rest. You know, all sorts of things the British can manage to keep building because they have the industrial capacity. And this is the real point when you're dealing with the Germans and you're talking about them in World War I. And something the British understood about the Germans, possibly better than the Germans did, their true industrial capacity. I'm not talking about the paper talk, I'm talking about the naval technology side, because you have to remember, a lot of the companies talk, there is a lot of informal intelligence going on there, there is a lot of discussions going on there, there is a lot of Navy days. We mentioned when we were talking about the King George V, the fact they were in Kiel in 1914 for a visit to see Kaiser Wilhelm. They have a lot of understanding of exactly what the capabilities of the yards are. The British know that the Germans couldn't complete the Salamis because they didn't have the turrets. They, they can't do that. The British will do something in 1914 which the Germans couldn't even dream of. Which is take over the completion and delivery of battleships which are being built for other nations in their yards. Buy them out, build them, fit them out, and, ma and crew them. The Germans have ships, Salamis, they have ship, uh, ships for their own navy in their yards which they cannot complete. Because of resources. There are lots of discussions made about their conquests in Russia and whether or not those would have solved their resource issues. I don't think they would have. For starters, look at the resource issues Russia had with getting resources out of Russia. Why the control of the... Why do you think the Germans in 1917, 1918, etc. were going to have any more of a success getting resources out of Russia? <laughs> Uh, do they suddenly have a lot of manpower they can deploy to it? No, oh no, it's off fighting in the army. 
now they're going to use Russian manpower because slave labor, which is already looking like it's about to do a communist takeover, which, by the way, you have been fomenting by making sure Lenin, etc., made it back to Russia. That's really going to be fun to try. That's not going to be at all personnel intensive to try and uh, oversee and watch. There are no good options, really, in the East for Germany. They win. That's not really a good option. I... Why? It would have been so pretty. The Francesco Caracolla class. The Italians. <laughs> Look at those lines. 15 inch guns. She's so pretty. 28 knot top speed. But I haven't called her a battle cruiser because she really isn't. She's got a solid 11.9 inch belt the whole way around. She's a battleship. But by golly, is she fast. Thanks to small chew boilers. She's what the Queen Lizard could have been if Jellico had got the small chew boilers he wanted when he was third sea lord. 105,000 shaft horsepower from 20 Yarrow boilers. Oh. Beautiful. Twelve six inch guns, eight four inch guns, twelve one point uh, forty millimeter guns. She is a good design. She shows the Italian quality. Let's hope a Normandy never encountered her. They would have been wiped out. Then there is the Riaculo. The mysterious Brazilian ship. Never ordered. But possibly was ordered. Was well, supposed to be the Armstrong Whitworth Design 781, which, if you want more information about, is either in the Tyne and Weir archives, the Cambridge University Library archives, or the Caird Library at Greenwich Maritime Museum. There are different sections which could re reveal it in each of them. My bet is that more information is in the Tyne and Weir archives, because whilst I realise my colleagues in the north of the country of the UK do go to the Tyne and Weir archives, I sometimes think there is a sort of imaginary line just south of Birmingham. Because every time I talk to some of my colleagues about going to archives beyond that line, they look at me as if I am venturing into the wild unknown. I like the Tyne and Weir archives. I like the Wirral archives. There are several archives in Glasgow where it's kind of like my version of walking into the pub in Cheers. They know your name. Hopefully for good reasons. I am going to make it a mission that when I am next in the Tyne and Weir archives, because so far I've been up there researching destroyers and cruisers, I am going to try and hunt down the Armstrong Whitworth Design 781 so I can actually refine exactly whether she's closer to Queen Elizabeth or the Revenge class in her design, or whether she's closer to the original idea for HMS Agincourt. Who knows? Mm. Vasilev's Constantinus. Okay, so we can all thank the world for World War One. World War One did one good thing. One good thing. Yes, lots of people died. We're sad about that. There are just horrendous loss of life, horrendous fighting. All those things are sad. Things. But it did stop a. Greek version of a Britain class called the Vasilis Continus coming into existence. And Constantinotus. Uh, we can all be happy about that. So, 
here is the thing. World War One and reality of naval races. Because I'm going to do 1915. Don't worry, this is not the final part. But... But... I am trying to emphasise, and I know I've just repeated but twice, trying to emphasise that the race is not a simple Anglo-German race. This lovely picture by Puck shows it. There is the British King. There is the Kaiser. There is... Well, I'm not quite sure if it's the French or the Italian president. I, In my mind, I hope it's the Italian because... Honestly, they are better ships. But there is a French tricolor at his feet, so I'll presume it's the French. And then there are the Americans and the Japanese. And it's no limit game of... Well, I hope Texas hold them, because that seems to be more appropriate when it comes to um, battleships and battle cruisers. But, you know... The reality of the naval races. What is going on in the world? It's not a simple race. It's not Britain versus Germany. It's not the South American race. It's not even the Ottoman German race or the Franco Italian Austro Hungarian races. There is a global race. Until we can get history out of silos, you cannot examine it properly. If you're looking at the Anglo-German naval race, and it was literally a race to see who could build the most battleships, Britain would win every time, and they would just be churning out 12-inch battleships, because the Germans would never go above 11 inches. They never. The Germans never jump first when it comes to the guns. They just don't. They respond to the British. They just do not jump first. The Americans jump first. The Japanese jump first. By gum, the Italians jump first with turret design. Oh, so beautiful. But it's not the Germans. So every time the British have to respond to a technological development and have to make their ships better that they have to respond and jump past someone else's technology, the Germans then respond to the British. The Germans are the challenging power and they aren't for actually mounting a freaking challenge. Now, Again, we can go into the debates of the science, the 11-inch versus the 12-inch, the hitting powers of the 13.5-inch, and all these sort of things. We can get into that. That is a lovely framework of reference. But here is the point. If I'm a politician or a treasury official, and you come to me to fund the battleship, and you say we're building versus the Germans. Okay. You'd say I want to build 13 and a half inch gun battleship. Which is going to add money. Going to have to. Cost increase. There's going to be logistics. There's supporting those shells. Moving everything around the world. All those things. Okay. How big are the German battleship guns? 11 inches. Why am I building this? if the government is just single tracked but the government isn't oh these guys, these other nations are all building 12 inch battleships now america's got 12 inch battleships italy's got 12 inch battleships the germans will eventually get 12 inch battleships we're not sure when so we'd like to uh, we'd like to steal march and get 13 and a half inch battleships and have super dreadnought yeah go on it makes sense it makes sense. It goes back to the question about Dreadnought, which comes up quite regularly. The British shouldn't have done Dreadnought because it out it destroys their advantage in numbers. Before I get into the Argent Corps, 
In what way does Dreadnought destroy their advantage in numbers? They had a huge advantage in pre-Dreadnoughts. They have a huge advantage in Dreadnoughts. In terms of numbers. And they have a huge advantage in terms of firepower. Now I have to say I'm not 100 sure about the German figures. I, I can't remember if I degraded them properly. I think I did, but you know, there. It does. It, it goes back to. It is. In simple terms. It is not enough for Britain, whose survival as an empire, as a preeminent world power, whose position is dependent upon having this trading and economic superiority, to settle for just racing the Germans, a industrial land power in Northern Europe. Britain is a world power power it has to be able to secure choke points around the world because it doesn't know who it's going to fight next it has a theory who it's going to fight next it's right based it off the level of their pomposity and their um, the shouting and their politics they keep doing with their uh, you know discussing and a building to risk against the British. But that doesn't mean that's all the British have got to consider. They might have to deal with a, bush, a, a, a bushfire war in, in South America. They might have to deal with a flare, another flare-up of the Russo-Japanese war. They might have the Italians and the French start knocking seven bells out of each other. They do not know what they're going to have to deal with next. All they know is that their trade is dependent upon making sure whatever it is that happens next is dealt with as quickly and efficiently as possible. And that means they have to be able to turn up with enough force to make sure. Or rather, they have to be able to turn up and be able to go, we're here with a cruiser, or we're here with this. Let's talk. Because the things that turn up if we fail, will turn up with enough force that you will listen. So it's better to talk to me, than have to listen to the funder of Fundra. And this brings me to my next topic. There are two things which we talk about when we're talking about HMS Agincourt. Whether she was going to be the battlecruiser variant of the Queen Elizabeth class. Maybe she'd have had small tube boilers and been able to do 28 knots like the Caricolos was supposed to be able to. Could have been. Would she have had 18 inch guns? Now, the last one is kind of an interesting one because basically the idea is where did the 18 inch guns suddenly appear from? Actually, they've been being worked on for a while. But the British are not going to jump to 16 and a half inch guns. And they've already heard that the Americans are working on 16 inch guns. They know people are working on 16 inch guns, they expect 16 inch guns. But 16 and a half is not enough of a clearance over 16. So they're probably going to jump to 18-inch guns. That's the next logical one, step up for the British to do. And randomly enough, 18-inch guns appear which are able to be fitted to HMS Furious. They are an extension of the 15-inch guns. So let's take this back. To get a battlecruiser... From the R class, they take off a turret. To get to 30 knots. 
there are several theories around Agincourt. My own one is that she was either another Queen Elizabeth class and was as conventional as can be, or she was something very special. She would have been something very special. But that makes sense cancelling her, because when war happens, they don't need it. They know what the Germans are going to have available. And they also know what the Germans are going to be capable of having available. Because, again, here is the thing, the dirty little secret which the Royal Navy banks on when fighting the Germans. The army's always going to take precedence for resources. If the army's fighting a massive war, then the navy is not going to get all the supplies it wants by a long way. And that's going to impact the speed and pace of new construction, the repairing of ships, the crewing of ships, everything. Because the German army is going to take precedence. The Royal Navy understands this. In the British system, the Royal Navy can t uh, can use its position to take a level of precedence. Remember, the British Army does get a lot of supplies. It does get a lot of support, but it's always faintly sure the Royal Navy. It always faintly seems to think the Royal Navy is getting more, and that's mainly because the Royal Navy uh, has fought many wars and many of them in Whitehall. It's quite good at managing the politics of it. So, what's the other option for a battle cruiser ish variant of Queen Elizabeth? How about six 18 inch guns, which would make sense of why free guns appear if you're ordering them in batches of three? Because you'd probably order nine to support, uh, nine barrels to support a single ship with six. And it would have stolen another advantage. It would have made another big advance. Twenty-eight knots, six eighteen-inch guns in three double turrets. That's a ship which you don't want to take on. You could also do that on the hull of a Queen Elizabeth. A little bit of playing around, but that's why you delete one on the turrets. I don't know. As I said, I have no real proof either way. I have lots of mutterings, lots of contextual documents, lots of snippets which can be arranged like the framing of any jigsaw in almost any way you can imagine. Because that's all you have for this picture. You have the edges at the moment of the jigsaw. You can't see the picture. You can only see the framing in many respects. And it could go any way. But it's an interesting thing to think about. And it would have had an impact on this stat Because... Honestly, if the British had produced an 18-inch gun version of the Queen Elizabeth class, even if they just produced one, and then said, right, and we're going to sit and figure out these 18-inch guns because we're worried about their, uh, their pace of fire, etc., or something like that, it would have forced everyone to sit back and think about what they were going to build next. So, what do we have coming up next? Um... <laughs> Mondas the Royal Navy, Section 5. Now, I'm currently trying to get the Royal Navy to respond to me. Well, not the Royal Navy. The I, I, I am talking to various sections uh, of museums because I want to try and uh, go and actually do some filming with monitors. We'll see how successful they are. They're being nice. They are responding. They're chatting away. we will see what we can get was nice um it might well it won't be for section five it'll be for one of the later ones but their stuff might filter into section five and as said the vote is live on patreon so if you would like to vote as to what those topics will be in june they are live now enjoy
And thank you to everyone who likes the videos. Thank you to everyone who subscribes. Thank you to everyone who has pressed the little bell so they get told when it's alive. Thank you to everyone who is on, has joined Discord for the chat. Thank you to everyone who's on Patreon, who's funding my research. It's really, really important. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who shares the videos on social media, Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. It really does... Um, well, it's fun. It winds up my colleagues. They can just tell me random places they've seen my videos turn up. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.